Fantastic. We've got a lot of people here sitting in the room, but they're all sitting behind for some reason. Uh, would you mind just coming up a bit? We've got lots of open chairs, empty chairs. We'd love to see you from you know, up close, if you don't mind. Any of you ready to move? Fantastic, thank you. Uh, my name is Swat Kumar. I am the regional head for Adobe Commerce, which most of you know as Magento Commerce. Uh, I've been in uh, this industry for about 15 years, uh, been in Singapore for about 10 years. Uh, today we've got these gentlemen coming from different backgrounds, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Michael. Michael Wojewski, I'm coming from Tibante. Tibante is a software house focusing now on PWA standards in Europe. Previously, I was working for Accenture and AT Kearney, helping the international retailers set up their omni channel in different parts of the world. Um, my name is Vitali. I, uh, I represent Poopsik. Um, we are an online store in Singapore that's selling BB and nursing products for about 10 years, last 10 years. And uh, yeah, I'm one of the co founders of this company. Hi everyone, my name is Jason. I'm the group CTO for Wing Thai. Uh, Wing Thai is an Asia MNC. We are based in Singapore. Uh, we are mostly in property development, but we are also big in retail. So we are the people who brought in brands like Uniqlo and G2000 into this region. Hi, I'm Anand. I work as the managing director for EMEA region for Renesis Technologies. I'm based out of London and takes care of all the EMEA operations for Renesis. Uh, at Renosys, we have been helping merchants and brands across the globe with their e-commerce development, with their omnichannel strategy, uh, and we are also uh, hosting this event for you guys. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, as you can see and hear, we've got a fairly diverse uh, panel, uh, panelists here, I should say, rather. Uh, people coming from retail store to online store. Uh, really online heavy stores and from technology and system integrator. We've chosen this topic which we call experience-led commerce because oftentimes when I go out and speak to the customers, we hear one thing which is quite common, especially uh, when they have decided to go online uh, and they have, they've had a fairly successful offline store selling you know, heaps and heaps and making millions of revenue, but for some reason they struggle online. So is it enough to have an online store? Or do you, or you should be doing something more to drive the traffic to make sure your customers are having an ama amazing experience online and offline? So with that in mind, my first question is, um, and that's probably for you, Michael, uh, since you come you from. This one. <laughs> uh, how important is experience in an online commerce business? So, well, definitely a customer's behavior, so the way the customers behave is extremely important, the way we're setting up the business model on the channel. So I think the best illustration of this is uh, when we look into the customers in Europe, in GCC countries like Dubai, Saudi Arabia, and Southeast Asia, right? So uh, different customers expect different uh, way we communicate with them, and in the end, we have a different setup of the omnichannel model. So starting with the Europe, uh, well, the convenience, life, uh, experience is becoming very important. The majority of retailers are focusing very much on how flex how provide a flexible way to deliver the order or or orders to the customers, right? So it's very important to, to, to focus on experience. On the other hand side, we have GCC countries where shopping and going into the brick and mortar stores is part of the social life. So there, the retailers set up the mod business model in a different way, try to provide this uh, personalized experience, luxury experience in, in stores, so facilitate with additionally with some online uh, experience the customer is expecting. And finally, Asia, where we all know that mobile first is the most important and the penetration of the mobile phone is extremely high. So here, the retailers are really much focusing on optimizing the mobile applications, so focusing on converting the web page to PWA standards where we can really, really improve the customer's experience through the, on, uh, through the mobile first and then make sure that the experience of the overall brand is also in, in place. So what I'm saying that the way customers buy is very important. We, need to, we have to understand and, and 
basically adjust the business model to that. You raised a really important point there. Like in GCC, people like to go to the store to really touch and feel the products before they buy. I mean, I've been living in Singapore for about 10 years, and I see the shopping malls on the weekends are really, really full. So uh, I'll probably put you on spot, Jason. I mean, you come from Wing Thai. You're uh, running a fairly successful business with G2000 and Uniqlo as brands. And knowing that in Singapore, people prefer to go to the uh, shopping mall on the weekend, what's your take on uh, the online and how important is that experience? And what are you making in terms of changes to, to bring that for consumer? Um, <coughs> difficult question. <laughs> OK, so um, Wing Thai is fairly successful in uh, bringing a lot of brands to this region uh, in the last few decades. Uh, we still think brick and mortar is very relevant for retail, for, for shopping. But every, uh, Michael touched on a very important point. You know, as we progress, you know, the, the markets also change. Uh, for example, Southeast Asia is mobile first. Uh, the current generation maybe comes to e-commerce, comes to commerce, uh, not through brick and mortar, not through PC maybe directly through mobile. So it is important not for us not to just be in one channel, brick and mortar. We need to expose our brands uh, through multi-channel, you know, be it brick and mortar, website, or even on a mobile app. This, this is very important. So this helps to extend the reach and also connect the brands with the customers. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Vitaly, I mean, you are very different to what Jason comes from. It's an online store, Pupsic, Pupsic Studio, am I pronouncing it correctly? And for you, it's the only channel. So how do you, and your company, uh, pardon me for saying it if, if it's not true, but how do you go about creating the experience on your website, which is the mo most important channel for you? Um, basically for us, uh, what's important is really avoiding of the pitfalls. So, like, say, there are things you can do to, to turn customers off. Like, if you have slow website, if you don't have mobile version, you know, or you, you ask too many questions during checkout, I mean, it's a sure way of, of uh, making customers uncomfortable and they'll just give up and then they'll go somewhere else. But in terms of other things, there's no right and wrong answers. We've played with many things. Uh, there's sometimes really no good answer. What is the good customer experience, in my, in my opinion, you know? So the, like, um, right now we talk about personalization. I mean, I'm still not convinced that personalization really means a good customer experience. It may be for some, but say for our case, it might not be. Because it's, there's different reasons, right? You know, maybe I'll give an example, right? Say, uh, you, why would grocery stores uh, mix up things and put milk at the back of the store, right? Is that a good customer experience? Well, not really because, I mean, you have to walk to the whole store to find that milk, right? But actually, everybody is doing it because it makes sense. You know, you expose these customers to other things while they're walking and so on. So there's no, there's no right or wrong answer here. So if you avoid the pitfalls, um, the rest is really depends on your style, depends on style of your customers, depends on what you do. And sometimes things apart from experience, things like what do you carry, what brands, at what price, actually take way more weight than, than actually how do you feel while you're buying it. You know? So that's, that's, that's our take on, on this question, basically. Very interesting. Uh, Anand, you come from technology background, helping these customers to be successful. What are some of the common things which you hear when you are speaking to the merchants in, in Europe? Yeah. So one of the important thing when we talk about experience is how that experience is going to be powered for the consumer. And often the case is that that experience is going to be powered by the data that the customer is willingly giving it to you. So how you utilize that data to create the experience that is truly unique for that particular customer is the key thing. And we often see the case, and I completely agree with Vitaly that personalization may or may not work all the time, but what is important is that when you're creating this experience, you have a culture of testing it and validating any assumption that you are making. So creating that entire infrastructure, not only on the experience, but how that experience is going to be measured and assessed and improvised on is the key thing. 
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Jason, you said something earlier during your comments around omni-channel. Uh, I want to pick you on that one because I generally believe that we're seeing the convergence between the online and offline. Uh, and we're seeing the behavior of consumer. They often start with the website, which might be on their mobile phone or desktop, and they might end up buying into the store. And brands struggle, uh, even when they're running the campaign, to connect those two dots because we don't know where they're coming from, right? So in your experience with Wingtie, who traditionally been really, really strong in retail sector, and now you are on your journey to an online store, how do you see that coming along? What, what are some of the uh, uh, learnings you could share with uh, people here? Um, I'll start with why we wanted to do that in the first place. Uh, um, like I said earlier, I think the most important thing is we know a large part of our customers are not coming to us through brick and mortar. And we realize that as you know, we continue to see a decline in the number of new customers coming to the brick model. In today's world, uh, a lot of the new generation customers, they, they don't read newspapers. They don't watch TV either. Yeah, so the only way you can get to them is, you know, be where they are. They could be on social medias, they're on their app all the time. So we need to make ourselves available to, you know, what they are more familiar with, where they are. So, for, for me, the most important thing when we talk about omni-channel is uh, we need to be everywhere. Okay, so the first thing is we need to make our brands known to these people so that even one day when they walk down Orchard Road and they see our store there, they, they feel the affiliation. So how do we do that? Even if we have to get ourselves onto a third-party platform or you know, build our own site you know, to, 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 to promote ourselves to the target audience, by online, we have to do that so that we build that affiliation, so that they know our brands and they know that you know we exist and 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 you know this helps to not convert them online but also via the other channels. Well, I think it's a very interesting question you ask. So, how once we really build a proper omni-channel, we already have like a, um, online, offline, and e-commerce. How we then connect the same customers in different channels and see this guy who's buying our store? It's the same guy who's buying our online store, right? So I think the, the answer is simple. Just create a proper CRM and proper loyalty program. I think there's a lot of brands doing this very well. For instance, H&M with the H&M Club. Uh, it's uh, basically, of course, there's a lot, a lot of ra other, re other reasons for them to create this kind of umbrella and communicate to the customer in a proper and kind of structured way. But I think the most important advantage for the retailer is that they can really see who is buying online and who is buying offline and they can propose them like a consistency of, uh, for both channels. So my answer to this question is loyalty program, proper CRM, that really combine and cover the whole communication channels we have to the current. Thank you, and for Vitaly, for you, I mean, someone who is in the online store business, uh, some of these challenges may not exist. So how do you go about using that data? Because obviously if someone is coming on your website, it's much easier to capture that and using it for driving that customer forward with your brand. So how do you go about uh, creating um, uh, those connections and making use of data? Um, well, we, uh, we are do our best <laughs> to use the data. I mean, it's not, um, I mean, we're using dot digital. I mean, just now the, you saw the presentation. I mean, it's quite helpful to follow up with the customers after they come to our website, but we do remarketing, we talk, I mean, basically whatever you heard, you know, any, any buzzwords, uh, it's all worth trying, it's all worth, I mean, as they say, basically, it's much easier to keep the customer rather than attract it, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of strange if you make a purchase and you never contact the person again or, or show him any, uh, what else do you have. So we, we, we are very heavy on post-sale post, post sale, um, targeting, basically, yes. So it's, and uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, about 80-90% of our revenue is from the second or third purchase. So, and it, it's, it's huge. And so it's, you know, attract one, but keeping it, it's, it's a whole new book. Yeah. And it, it, data is, is a major, major way in that, yeah. And data brings me to the next question where, you know, we've got a lot of brands who've been running through marketplaces, right? They've been um, using those as a channel and making sure that customers are buying it. But at the end, 
they don't really get the data back from those marketplaces. Right, so um, in, in your world, how do you go around that as, as a problem? Because it's important for you as a brand to understand who's buying it and who's been the repeat buyer. And then also there, there is a fine balance between a marketplace and having your online store. So any, anything you could share around those two, especially you two since you've been running um, the online stores. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting question and many people ask me even in our board meeting. Um, I look at third-party platforms in many ways, but one of the key things we, we, we need them because just think about it. Why would a lot of brands open their stores in Marina, Marina Bay Sands, uh, in Orchard Road? You know, some of them, or most of them, might not make enough to actually cover for their expensive rental. But it's still important to have those you know, shops you know, in the right places. So think of it, of the third-party platforms or channels like this. You need to be there because you are exposing your brand to millions of customers every day. Doesn't matter if, if the platform don't share you know, the transactional data with you or the customer data, but it is still important to be there because this is where you get the exposure. You know, you can later on leverage this halo effect and then you can convert the customers in, on your own website or maybe even in your brick and mortar store. So this is how I look at, you know, the advantages of a platform. Great. Michael, I've got a question for you, um, especially around the technology area. Uh, especially considering in Southeast Asia, we've got lots of consumer who are using mobile as a device. That's the first point of contact for any brand with a consumer. Uh, and we know that um, downloading, creating an app, it's easy, but making sure it's successful, people are downloading it, using it, which means a huge marketing expenditure from a brand um, my question to you is, what are you seeing, uh, especially towards the um, PWA, and how do you see the future shaping up in that space? Okay, so well, so we already there was like a lot of slides already in the in the, in the speed margin, the conference saying about this uh, mobile gap and about the traffic versus how much traffic we have in online uh, in mo in, com in uh, sorry in mobile and how much of revenue is generated through the mobile. So we know there's a huge potential to catch. Right? So we also know that all the retailers to exist in Southeast Asia especially, they need to go the presence on the mobile, mobile phones. Right? And, and since, since recently we only have one solution, which was a native application that you have to download on your, on your, on your mobile phone, then you have to maintain. The re retailers also have to pay a lot of money to maintain the COS in Android and all these other systems. However, uh, since recently, since I think 2018, when Google introduced this PWA standards, we have a very interesting alternative. Uh, PWA standards uh, was already a lot of slides about this as well today, but I think it's a, it's just innovative way to get to the customers through the mobile phones, which have a lot of benefits for both retailers and for the final customers. For retailers, basically they have a very easy way to commit to the client. They have the same set of advantages like from the native application, and finally they don't have to pay for maintaining uh, maintenance of the. Uh, mobile applications in iOS and Android. For the customers, they basically have the same benefits as they have for the, from, from the native applications, but in the same time, they don't have to download, up, upgrade. This is everything like done in the, in, 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 in the background, right? So, so what I'm saying uh, since recent, if we all agree that to be present here in Asia, you need to go with the mobile. What I want to say, I want to convince all of you just to check the PWA standards, which, has, which are really growing and extremely interesting technology, which significant, which is step by step, but systematically is replacing the native application. Uh, Anand's uh, question for you, I mean, when you go and speak to the customers, like, how many of them often ask you about the PWA and do, you re do they really understand how it's going to make the difference and what sort of common questions you get? So PWA in our experience is one of the most interesting technology that has come to the space of e-commerce because like Michael has mentioned, it reduces the friction of downloading an app. And so there is a huge interest from the retailers and the merchants to explore whether PWA is a suitable technology for them or not. And so we see a lot of requests coming through us, and they are open to the idea. I think what they are struggling with currently is 
whether they are using or not technologies such as uh, AR and VR or not, they are struggling to see whether they are going to use these technologies in future or not, and whether there is going to be enough support on PWA platforms for these new things that are available on the mobile platform or not. These are the things that they are currently evaluating, and that is probably one of the reasons why, although there is a good intent and good, uh, good traction in terms of inquiries, but there are not many people who are converting to PWA yet. I think they probably need a lot more case studies and a lot more forums like this where people talk about the success case studies on the PWA adoption. Um, thank you, Anand. So that brings me to the next question, which is more uh, towards uh, Vitali and uh, Jason. Um, when you start looking at the technology world, it's, it's quite complex, right? You've got many technology platforms, you've got many vendors out there. Everyone starts with more or less the same kind of message. Customer experience is really important. Uh, therefore, we've done this, 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 but it's, 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 it's jargon, right? It's, it's really hard to dissect who is going to be the partner of choice for us because they're all speaking the same language. So when you are selecting any, uh, any partner in this journey, what are some of the key things you look at? Any learnings you could share with us today? Uh, maybe I'll try to answer. I mean, the, you're talking about technology partners, right? Technology, uh, yeah. um, system integrators, sure. partners. Yeah, I mean, um, we had experience with both good and bad partners. I mean, basically, the, what we're looking for, um, basically, I mean, just low cost, high quality. I mean, that's what, that's what it is. Because, I mean, obviously you can get very good money, right? And, uh, but when you're trying to be afford, it's, it's quite a search. I mean, it took us, it took us uh, Hello. Uh, it took us, I think, almost two years to find a Magento partner. Because we just couldn't, I mean, it's not so easy. I mean, basically, you really have to try. And, um, but if we found them, I mean, eventually, I mean, and some partners become good first and then they spoil at some point, you know, because they got sold to somebody else, so they changed their plan. It, it, it's a struggle, it's a constant struggle. I mean, it's basically, I mean, what we're looking for is a very good support. We're looking for, uh, what we don't like when partners are very narrow, defined themselves, and they don't want to go slightly outside of their expertise because many times things break. They don't just break in one area, they break in several areas. And we have to go and say, is this, can you fix it? No, it's, not, it's, it's the other partner's job. I mean, can you fix it? No, it's, it's their job. You know? And then they can't decide who's gonna fix it. But actually it's kind of straddling both areas. So uh, we prefer somebody who is more flexible, who is doing something, but they don't mind fixing in its neighboring area and so on. So it, it, it is tough, it is tough to find this, yeah. Took us many years. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of time. Uh, Jason, yeah, anything yeah. from you? What he said really res resonates with what we are facing right now. Uh, but going back to when we first started to research and evaluate all the different options, uh, I must say, uh, we really don't know. <laughs> so we don't know what is best for us and what we should choose and all that, but uh, we have a few underlying fundamentals here. We want to keep an open mind here because uh, we really you know, want to try. And uh, we also want to fail fast because uh, we think that's the best way to learn. So we chose a platform, we chose Magento at the end of the day because uh, it's, the time to market is really quick. But it has also its robustness and scalability which is required later on. So it, it gives us the opportunity to, to try faster and feel faster and learn from it. So this is one thing that we, we, you know, one reason why we chose Magento. In terms of the partners that help us to implement, um, we, we also try to do that, keep an open mind. So we, we, we talk to various people and we eventually end up with someone who is more flexible. Yeah, someone who helps us to understand our customers' needs. I think that's the most important. Yeah, so, uh, and we haven't launched, so I wouldn't talk about uh, whether it's successful or not, but so far, uh, I think, you know, our partners are doing a re really good job. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think I it's hope. very important to understand that, well, now choosing the technology partner is just not a single date. This is like a marriage, most likely for the lifetime. So, 
uh, having a proper partner who really understands the wider scope of the business uh, in terms of the also IT architecture, I think it's very important because then they take in the responsibility, they really put themselves in the role of the advisor. So I think the best solution for the retailers is just they focus on the, the core business, selling the staff, but the IT advisor, IT partner is then coming to them and say, look, there's something new on the market, this PWA, whatever. You have to go with this because our competitors, everyone is doing this. So I think once you have a partner who have an open mind and like a wide and very, uh, say, different offering, they are able to really assist the company for the long term. Uh, that, that actually brings uh, to my next question, which, uh, which we're seeing a lot in the market is, um, when it comes to technology, there are many technologies out there uh, the processes may not necessarily change within the organizations and it sometimes becomes a roadblock because you've bought this new technology, this new platform, however your processes remains as you were doing before having this technology. So uh, my question probably, and feel free to answer if um, any one of you, but how much is that process and change management is important? while you're making these decisions, while you are uh, selecting the technology, and how do you manage within your organization? I can potentially start and you guys can jump in. So what we have seen is that in our experience that whenever you are introducing a new system, a new technology within an organization, often the support has to come from the top, but it has also, it needs to be there on the ground level as well. Because ultimately, things like omnichannel and all, they would not work unless you have support from various organizations. So whether it is your warehouse operation, whether it is somebody who is taking care of CRM, or whether it is somebody who is taking care of your IT, you all, we need to make sure that all of those people are on board with the solution that you're proposing. How do you do that? We often make sure that all the stakeholders who are relevant for the program that you are launching are available for us to talk to, to give our advice and to take their opinion on how this program is going and how, what success might look like for them. So if you define what success might look like for them, then you can work, to work, work towards that. But defining what success might look like for all the stakeholders involved is the key thing in our opinion. Anything to add? Jason, Vitaly? Oh, again, I think so you have to think from, from the top down. So you have to think about strategic goals that the companies have. But then you have to adjust the business models, so adjust the processes. Then you go with the business requirements, and then finally go with the solution. I think this is very important to really make the, the, the technology change driven by the business and by the expectation and the strategic goals and make this technology change consistent with the overall strategy of the company. If you start to think about the IT first and say, okay, this is the system I want to implement because of some reason, then I have to adjust all the processes, all my strategic goals and, and the worst case scenario of my clients. This would not work. Great. Anything, anything to add? Anyone of you? In, for me, it's a, for us, it's a, we're a smaller organization. So for us, it's... A, uh, we don't have many layers to approval, so usually if we like something, we just we just decide to use it. We use it, right? So there's no, I mean, and if we don't like it, we stop using it. So there's no, I mean, the decision is very fast, and uh, usually, I I mean, I, I personally is a, a technology junkie. Whatever right. new, I, I want to try. I want I want to implement. I want to try. It doesn't work. I give up and I I, I, I and uninstall and so on. So, I mean. I love, I love playing with new technology. I think it's, there's a lot of new things there. Every year there's something new. I mean, that's, that's what keeps me among maybe interested in, in, in keeping this business because there's so many new things every year appearing that worth trying, worth, you know, and see what the result they're bringing in. It's just like, you know, uh, it's a, it's, I think e-commerce is very heavily technologically, uh, uh, technology business that cannot really survive for long by just, Doing something and keeping it for many years, yeah. You have to keep upgrading, keep changing, keep adapting. I mean, there's no choice. Yeah. Jason, would you like to add anything to it? Yeah, I think they, they cover a lot, but just to share with everyone who comes from the same kind of company I'm in, uh, a company that doesn't come from pure tech, uh, I think you need to have more patience. Education is very important. You might have to repeat this 10 times, 20 times, 30 times, 40 times. You know, you have to keep doing that because you have to educate the company. And I, I totally agree. It needs to come from top down. You know, for me, it's a board level decision. 
you need that support to make things happen. The last thing is change management. It's very important. You know, this is a huge change for the organization. If you don't manage the change, it's never going to happen. So change management is a key to this. Fantastic. Well, we've just been given time checks, so uh, I would like to open the question to the floor. Anyone interested in learning something new today, or if you haven't learned already? Uh, no? Anyone? Uh, can someone please pass the mic? That's fine. Thank you, Adrian from IT Consultis. So, uh, for partner selection, uh, you mentioned that uh, you know flexibility and uh, and being open to different different kind of uh, uh, solutions. That that was uh, one of the key criteria. Just a quick question on how, like, when when a, a vendor comes to you and and, and propose a, a potential plan, how important it is to have an integrate solution with different partners. For example, having uh, uh, different kind of agencies, for example, different kind of expertise as part of one proposal, one one solution, instead of having you know just just one integrator that does everything and that can offer like a 360 solution, for example, which never really exists, but more having like kind of a group of different different uh, technology providers. Was there any of you? I mean, I can see I, I, I much prefer one versus many. I mean, again, because of this problem with the boundary, because many problems, they happen, uh, several things break, and so we, can't, we don't want to uh, argue about who is going to prefer one one-stop solution. So currently, I mean, I'll give you an example, right? So currently, for example, we were looking for a partner who can do, say, both Magento development and yet has expertise in Windows service, server management, Windows service management. I, I couldn't find. I mean, so every time Katak said, but you know, we're only Linux. We, we don't do Windows, you know, and Magento runs on Linux, you know. So it's, I mean, I wish I could have one partner that could do both, but I, I have not found them yet, at least at affordable price. Well, I, I think if you really want to have one partner who's doing all, you have to pay a lot, which is not the case in many, many situations. So I think it really depends what, how, what is the cooperation between the partners. I mean, you can build the offer, which consists of different agencies, fine. But then you need to have really somebody who's leading this and saying, I'm taking responsibility for this. I will just run this PMO later on. So there would need to be one. I mean, from the client perspective, there need to be always one point of responsibility. However, how many partners inside? If they communicate well, if they take the responsibility themselves, if, they, if then the client will not be involved in the fights between integration, I think it's okay. At least in the European market, totally. At least in the European market, what we have seen is that it is becoming increasingly common for the partners to come together and then approach a merchant with a single proposal. And they bring together all the different expertise that you bring on the table. And like you have said, uh, Michael, so you, from a merchant's point of view, you still have a lead partner, but then it is very transparent that all the other partners are also involved in the process. And when I'm talking, I'm talking about partner, they are technology partner as well as solution integrator. So, and technology partner is a norm. So for example, if somebody is looking for marketing automation, and if you know that these are the various players for marketing automation, you would bring them along with you. And more often than not, they would help you close the deal as well. Actually, I even think that the big accounts, uh, big international companies, they start to realize that really the change is happening in the small agencies, right? So they are really more and more happy to invite these small companies to be a part of this like, conglomerate of the companies putting offering on the table because they know they really bring the cutting and change. So I think that, as, as you said, I think that uh, in the developed market, this, this kind of approach of having many companies placing one offer is becoming more and more popular. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we're running out of time, but if there is any other question from the crowd, we'll take it happily. Any other questions? I just want to know from a customer point of view, from the, maybe this is for Jason and Fitali, how do you uh, review, how frequent do you review the customer behavior? Because it may end up, right, the, uh, the, the millennials' behavior of buying is different than the older generation. And how frequent is that, that you say, okay, this is not 
working, then we change the strategy for your business model. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I won't be able to answer in my current capacity, but I came from eBay, so I used to manage eBay Southeast Asia. So speaking from an online perspective, um, uh, we look at it very often. But um, I always educate my team, like, you know, when, when you have an online business, data is everything. Yeah, we, we stop being very subjective on how we look at customers because everyone has a different view about it. But data says everything. You know, they tell you what the customer like or don't like. And if you were to do a good analysis on the data, you know, you see the trend, they tell you that, you know, maybe what you have done is not working anymore. You know, it reflects a lot on your business, you know, and your analysis. So timing depends largely on individual companies, like, you know, when they think it's a good period to review the customer base. But I think uh, largely depends on, you know, how you consume the data. Data is probably the most important thing. Yeah. Um, for us, I guess it's... Uh the answer is not how often it's. It's not based on a regular interval. Uh, it's really based. Uh, we. I mean, I, I. I understand that basically we started this ten years ago, and things have changed since. But we are growing older, and we 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 used to certain things. Uh, so the way we usually adapt to new trends is by uh, by spying on our younger competitors. So you know, you have somebody, a new mom appearing, studying an online store, and then doing something, and we see the distraction. We see you know people are going there talking about it. Okay. Let's do it also. I mean, so that, that's how we, we just watch our young competitors, basically. <laughs> and that, that's how we adapt, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, with that, we're going to wrap up our panel discussion. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you found it useful and uh, it answered some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you.